The 2024 NFL Draft is in the rearview mirror. Now we look ahead to OTAs and minicamps as the NFL season comes creeping ever so closely uh, to our eyes and ears uh, in 2024. Welcome to the Ravens Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Samuel Njoku. Today, we're going to talk all about this draft. I mean, it was a big draft, nine picks for the Ravens to look over and dissect. We'll talk all about that draft, all about those picks, and we'll look ahead uh, with Kevin Ostriker, who we will go ahead and dissect a little bit further with those picks and then look ahead into the 2024 season and what those picks could possibly do for those Ravens uh, as they make a quest for another shot at the Super Bowl championship. But first, the Ravens get it done. They finish it. We've been talking about the draft since the Ravens lost, really, in the AFC Championship game to those Kansas City Chiefs. Trying to figure out how the Ravens go ahead and recoup some of the losses they had in the offseason. I mean, the Ravens lost a lot of good players. not Maybe not marquee starters, but definitely strong contributors on those cheap deals. And they went ahead to other ventures to get that big contract. But the Ravens do not have the cap space for it. What's the way to get good players without having to spend too much money? The NFL draft. That's why the GMs that can do a good job and get those talented players are usually in the forefront mentioned as one of the top in the league because their teams are usually in the championship games or the playoffs or what have you. Eric DeCosta has been known as one of those guys. So this was a big test for him. Ravens lost Patrick Queen. Geno Stone's gone. 60% of their offensive line has been decimated, left, gone. All they have is Tyler Lindenbaum and Ronnie Stanley, who has regressed a little bit due to injury, I will say. Also need to work on depth in the, the DB room because Marlon Humphrey's getting, he's not getting old. I won't say that because, you know, he's, he's younger than me. I can't call him old, but he's older. He's been injured. They lost Ronald Darby. They were able to bring back Arthur Marlette. But, you know, we, you can never have too many corners. The Ravens had to find a way to shore up that room. And then, of course, the wide receiver room. Much maligned across the fan base. Odell Beckham Jr., gone. Rashad Bateman, back. Extended. The Ravens had an opportunity to do a fifth-year option with Rashad Bateman. They take it a step further. You're with us until 2026. He signed you up. The actually which is very surprising. The numbers have not been released yet. From what I understand, it's a team-friendly deal. So if you're a Ravens fan and you're thinking, well, maybe that's such a great idea to bring Rashad Bateman and lock him in. We'll talk all about that uh, with Kevin Ostriker, but it's there. It's happening. So you have Rashad Bateman. You have Zay Flowers. You bring in Nelson Aguilar. You got Tylen Wallace in the back end to help you in, with depth. But if you're a Ravens fan, you're really hoping for another receiver to come in and shore up and solidify that receiver one because the Ravens fans know that you need weapons. And the Chiefs know that for sure. They've already brought in Marquise Brown to come in. Uh, a guy everybody knows in the city of Baltimore very well. Drafted by the Ravens in the first round a few years ago. So the Chiefs are doing what they can to stay relevant. After winning their second straight championship, the Ravens need to make sure they're focused on doing exactly the same thing to keep pace with what we assume to be one of the favorites to go to the Super Bowl once again. But enough about the introduction to everything. Let's talk about the draft. We won't go too deep into it because we do want to get Kevin Ostriker in to talk about it with us, but he's not here yet, and we got to talk about it, right? So the Ravens, pick 30. Many people assumed that the Ravens would go offensive line in the first round. But the way the draft was set up, I warned you guys last episode that there's a lot of good talent in the offensive line and a wide receiver. I expected there to be a rush for those guys, which means that defenders, maybe some, maybe some uh, tight ends would fall down. Some really good players on those positions outside of offensive line and wide receiver would fall to the 25-30 range where the Ravens were salivating in the mouth, waiting. What did the Ravens do? The Ravens get Nate Wiggins from Clemson. Baller. Baller. I know a lot of Ravens fans, content creators, were paying close attention to offensive linemen, even receiver. 
<clears throat> excuse me. But it was Nate Wiggins that fell. On my board, I had him at the 15, 16 range. I thought that he was definitely top half of the best 32 players in that draft, and he fell all the way to 30. He is a baller. Best cover corner easily. I don't think anyone can say otherwise. He's a phenomenal cover corner. What he lacks a little bit is with the run support. He's not really known to be a run stopper. Uh, I mean, he's a cornerback. His job is to cover, but the way defenses are beginning to evolve, you're going to need a guy who can both cover the receiver and stop the run. Now, they build him at about 170, but uh, Wiggins already has gone on record as saying, you know, I, I wasn't eating before the combine, likely to get his numbers up as far as his uh, 40 time. He's closer to the 180 range, but the Ravens are going to work with him during the offseason, if not this offseason, definitely next offseason, to get him a little bigger because you're playing in the AFC North. The Steelers, Bengals, and Browns run the football. Maybe not to the extent that the Ravens do, but they run the football and they do it well. So you're going to need to have your corner. If he's going to be out there, predominantly, I'm assuming on the outside with your fastest receiver, the defender, the defending team's best receiver, you're going to need to learn how to stop the run. But I love that pick. I give it a A++++. I thought that the Ravens would be reaching for offensive linemen at this point in 30 because the only guy I had slightly in that fringe 30 spot was Tyler Guyton, and he was picked up prior to the selection. So the Ravens had an opportunity to get a corner that's going to really be dangerous. You, you cannot have enough good corners, and he's, in my opinion, one of the best. So great job by the Ravens to get that corner. Next pick in the second round, they go Rosengarten, an offensive tackle from Washington who the Ravens thought that, you know, they see him as playing right tackle for now, but he has the skills. And I talked about this on social media. He has the ability to play inside and outside. So don't be surprised if he struggles a little bit at right tackle and maybe one of the other uh, offensive linemen that were brought in last season takes that spot away from him. They move him inside. Again, Kevin Zeitler is gone. John Simpson's gone. They have really no set guy for guard. So he's definitely versatile enough and skilled enough where he can possibly play inside a little bit, maybe for the first year or two, and then move outside to either the left or right side, depending on what the Ravens decide. But he's a solid piece, a great pick. One that I hear that the Ravens are really focusing on for day two, and he fell to their laps. I'll tell you now, the Ravens didn't make any trade. They didn't trade up for anybody. We'll talk to Kevin Zeitler about that. I mean, sorry, Kevin Ostriker uh, later on about whether or not that was such a good idea. But the Ravens stayed pat. They stayed there and waited. They got some calls. The Ravens already said, especially in the first round, they had eight callers for, for Wiggins. But that card came in immediately. As soon as they got to pick 30 and they knew that Wiggins was available, they did not hesitate to take him. So the Ravens did that the entire draft. They just sat there and waited. They're going to fall to me. I'll take whoever I can get. And that's one of the perks of being really one of the better teams in the league roster-wise. The Ravens are set. I won't say set. I mean, of course they want to get better, but this team is ready to compete now. Sure, they can get better in some areas, but they have the luxury of being able to say, okay, well, we're not going to take away a piece that could possibly help us win a championship. We'll just sit there and wait by our time, and hopefully a good player falls to us. They believe they got that good player with Rosengarten uh, and... and Nate Wiggins for sure. The Ravens made other picks, and I'll get into it, but I want to really focus in on the fourth round of the draft where they got their guy, Tez Walker, a receiver who Ravens fans were really hoping to get. I mean, they weren't really pushing for Tez. I, I saw some mock drafts where Tez Walker was definitely a, uh, a commodity for the Ravens where they thought that they would come in and, and get uh, some some burn, but there, there, there were teams, I mean, there were fans 100% focusing in on getting a wide receiver. They did not feel that Rashad Bateman is the answer, and we'll get to that a little later. I don't know uh, if I totally agree with that, but they want to solidify that wide receiver room, and Tez Walker is the guy who demands immediate attention. John Harbaugh called him a Torrey Smith type of guy, and Torrey Smith really came in and instilled himself as the wide receiver too automatically from Jump Street from his rookie season, so Expect something like that for Tez Walker. In my opinion, you guys know me. 
If you don't know how to run routes effectively, I mean, I want you to be a great route runner, great catcher of the football. I'm not as high on you as many others, but he, the skill set's there. He, his deep routes, he's done to perfection. I think he really needs to work on his, you know, his, his comeback routes, you know, his ins and outs, really catching the football in traffic, stuff like that. I would like to see him improve upon that. But when you get to day three of the draft, Everybody's a project. I mentioned this. Everybody's a project. The things that you can't teach, speed, grit, toughness. Tez Walker has that. And that's something you cannot teach. Route running, being crisper on routes, knowing when to put your hands up, where to attack the football, stuff like that. You can teach that. If you have a good coach, that can be taught at this level. And it won't take as long as you think. For instance, a guy that I think about a lot, DK Metcalf, came in raw. I thought, man, well, he has the physical tools, but he can't run a route to save his life. Now, Metcalf is one of the better route runners in the league. So get a coach that can teach you how to do the little things, the nuances of the game, especially in the receiver position, and you'll succeed. He has the tools. He has the speed. He has the height. He has the frame. I don't see a reason why he can't succeed. And he'll, he'll get his opportunity, I'm sure. He'll be on the outside along with Zay Flowers, possibly on the inside. And, and you know, Rashad Bateman really likes to play in or out, depending on the situation. This team could be set for years to come with this wide receiver group. But Tess Walker being brought in was a huge, huge, huge uh, uh, benefactor for the Ravens. And I think it's going to pay dividends, if not this year, definitely next year, I think. So kudos to the Ravens. There have been other picks that the Ravens made, and we'll talk about it in depth with Kevin coming up in a little bit. But all in all, I think that this draft was very well done out by Eric DaCosta. Very well done out. Now, it's hard to grade a draft less than 48 hours after it ends, you know? It's very hard to, to grade a draft in this scope. You know, we haven't seen them end of the field. We don't know how they'll react to the NFL game. All we can really go by is how great they are talent-wise, what are the areas of concern? Are they fixable? How much work needs to be done to fix these issues? So those are the things that I look at. But when it boils down to it, it's up to the team and the player to mesh and, and make it work. Mostly the player. So it's hard to really grade it outside of the scope of what I just mentioned. But if I go off of just what the factors I'm looking at, what is he good at? What is he great at? What does he need to work on? Can we fix it? Top tier draft. In my opinion, top tier draft. I think they waited. They didn't reach for anyone. Areas of need, players who fit areas that the Ravens needed to fix and plug, just magically fell into the lap of Eric DaCosta, which is hilarious. And that's usually because other teams are reaching for areas of need. And some people have to. I mean, let's be honest. The the, the Bears can't afford to wait for somebody to fall. You got to go get somebody. You got to help your boy Caleb Williams out. These other teams, the Steelers, Bengals, you can't, you got to reach because the, the Ravens are sitting here. So the, the Ravens have the luxury of being able to sit back and relax and a lot of great football players fell into their to laps. We didn't mention uh, Tampa, cornerback out of Iowa State. He comes in and he's he'll be a dog for them. So there's a lot of great players that came into the Ravens draft laps. As you will, I'm sure Eric DaCosta and the Radio Scouting Department are very, very, very happy with the way things turned out. But when we come back, we'll have Kevin Ostriker, host of the Lockdown Ravens. We're going to go in depth. I'm going to go list by list, and we'll see what he thinks. I know a couple of players that he wanted the Ravens to get didn't end up coming to Baltimore, so we'll see what he believes his thoughts are. If the Ravens have done enough to really hone in as one of the top teams in the NFL post the draft. Next on the Ravens Talk Podcast. Welcome back to the Ravens Talk Podcast. As you mentioned, we have with us Kevin Ostriker, host of Locked On Ravens. Uh, he's here to give us a breakdown of the draft that went underway for the Ravens, nine picks uh, in total for the Ravens in 2024. Welcome to the podcast, man. I appreciate you having me back on, Sam. It's been a crazy weekend. Still still not over yet as, as we're recording this year. There's still a lot of the aftermath after yeah. the draft with Baltimore, nine total picks and 
They they stayed pat the entire time. No trade ups, no trade backs. They they, they must have really liked the way the board fell to them. Oh yeah, the, the board fell perfect for them. When I, when I went on your show earlier uh, this week, I told you I thought the Ravens would trade up uh, because a lot of good players would fall. But man, they kept falling uh, to the point where the Ravens were. Uh, comfortable to stay pat, no trade ups like you mentioned, uh, no trade downs. No wise knew some trades, so that's a good thing. But um, let's talk about the draft. We're gonna go pick by pick and really get your thoughts on how it went. Uh, I think the first pick is probably the most notable and the one that uh, people are talking about the most, and that's Nate Wiggins, uh, the Clemson Q- cornerback, uh, cover corner. A guy who can really—I mean, he has the speed and really the breakout speed to cover any receiver in the league, you'd hope. Um, what are your thoughts about the way the first round fell? Uh, we did mention that a lot of good players came down. Are you excited or happy with the Wiggins pick? Was there another player you thought would be better in that situation? Or, uh, yeah, do you think everything went out perfectly? I think it went the way it was supposed to based off of how the board fell. I think everybody was so caught up in the offensive line talk. It really was that throughout the pre-draft process, too, for the Ravens. And I mean, rightfully so. The offensive line was the biggest need entering the draft. But once Tyler Guyton went at 29 to Dallas, there was really no other offensive line that I would have taken at 30. Graham Barton had already gone, a lot of those other tackles as well. So at that point, if I'm Baltimore, I'm not reaching for a guy who I have a second-round grade on. At that point, I'd rather just take BPA and then attack it in the second round. And that's what they did. We'll get to that in a minute here. But for Nate Wiggins... It's a pick that the more I look at it, the more I like it. Just in terms of even the way the cornerback class in the first round fell was pretty shocking, if we're being honest. I mean, Kenyon Mitchell was the first corner off the board. He didn't go till 22. Crazy. And then Terry on Arnold, Detroit, was 24. Detroit traded up for him. There was an early run on those quarterbacks. Obviously, I think the big surprise for everybody was Michael Penix going to Atlanta at number eight. I'm, I'm still not over that pick personally. It's just how, how that ended up going. Same. But Bo Nix goes to Denver. And you wanted to see those quarterbacks off the board and all six of them go in, in what, the top 12, I think. So yeah. that was a good thing for Baltimore. The offensive lineman run, it was it happened throughout. Talese Fawaka goes at 14. Marius Mims, Troy Fautan, who both go to AFC North Rivals. So those were targets, but more so unrealistic targets. I think the guys I was kind of looking at was Graham Barton and Tyler Guyton, as I mentioned there. But Wiggins is fast. I think that's the first thing that pops off of the tape for you is the speed. 428 at the 40. Now, he does have a bit of a slender frame. I think he slimmed down a little bit for the combine. That was around 170, but he, he plays more around 180. But even so... The Ravens are probably going to want him to add a little bit of weight entering the season. But I think really where that's going to come is after his first year. I think once he gets a full offseason of NFL training, that's where we're going to see the body transformation. But the NFL is about speed, Sam. We we know that, especially on offense. Chiefs go out there, get Xavier Worthy. They bring in Marquise Brown. The AFC North has a bunch of speedsters, too. You need a guy who has great recovery speed. Nate Wiggins has that. The ability to be sticky in coverage. And you mentioned it. He's one of the better cover corners, if not the best cover corner in this class plus we know baltimore loves their versatility and wiggins is somebody that can play on the outside in the slot and the ravens love their three corner rotations on the outside too entering the draft the slot was fine i mean they had arthur millet Ardarius washington pepe williams but mm-hmm. they lost ronald darby and if you want to say they traded out ronald darby for nate wiggins one for one i'll take that trade 10 times out of 10 11 times out of 11. Oh, man. I mean, that's a huge upgrade in my opinion. And I agree with you. I think, and you mentioned everything I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, they're going to want him to build up some bulk. They'll get that in the offseason. If not this year, then definitely at the end of the season, they'll they'll get a program together for him to gain some weight. But the, his speed is his trait. It's what makes him special. And he's not really known as a turnover guy. Uh, but neither was Deion Sanders, really. And you make the comparison between him and Marcus Peters. I think Peters is more of a guy who comes in and jumps routes and makes those gambles. And I think this guy's just fundamentally sound. He's going to cover your best guy. He's not afraid to go toe-to-toe with anybody. So uh, when they play the Dolphins, the Chiefs, and they've got those speedy receivers on the outside, or even on the inside sometimes, I think the Ravens are going to feel comfortable with him being that guy to, uh, to cover that guy. Uh, but you mentioned it. The Ravens tried to go offensive lineman. At least you thought that was the plan going into this draft. Uh, the draft didn't fall that way. But in the second round, they got their guy, Rosengarten, to come in and really be possibly uh, a, a steady force for the team moving forward for years to come. What are your thoughts on Rosengarten? Is there another uh, pick that you would have liked better? Is there a guy, uh, a lineman, that may have been picked a day, I mean, a pick afterwards that you might have? Uh, had better chances with you think for the Ravens or do you think that the 
the pick for Rosengarten was the right one. I think for Rosengarten, there were really, at that point, two offensive linemen I was considering there, and it was Rosengarten being one of them, but I think Kingsley Suomataya, the BYU guy, was the other one. I probably have King, I'd probably pick Kingsley just by a, a hair. It really was close i would have been completely okay with either one obviously they go with rosengarten but i understand why the ravens went with rosengarten when the ravens lost three starters on their offensive line it gave them an opportunity to go out there and mold what a todd munkin offensive line would be because a lot of people when munkin was hired it was well he's gonna inherit all these skill position players what's he gonna do with them how mm -hmm. well do they fit his offense but something that wasn't really talked about well what does he want his offensive line to look like so you lose three starters and i think the plan for the ravens is they obviously wanted to get younger and i think they wanted to get more athletic and rosengarten is certainly an athlete ran a sub 5 40 yard dash at the combine has really good foot speed his hand placement is really good now the thing with rosengarten he's right around 308 pounds so baltimore's taking guys that, you know, aren't necessarily that those bigger, bulkier players. Yeah. Rosengarten, I think the term everybody's using this weekend is sand in the pants in terms of the, uh, <laughs> the the anchor that he has. It's a little it's a little left to be desired there with the anchor. So mm -hmm. some of those power rushers or speed to power guys could give him some trouble early on. But he's incredible at pulling out. We know the Ravens love when you're talking about getting to the next level, pulling out into space. They love that. So he's able to get one block down, go out and immediately get to the next level there. So for Rosengarten, he also liked the versatility as well. We talked about Wiggins and what he can do. Rosengarten playing on the right side, but also has left tackle experience. So if Baltimore goes to 2025 and Ronnie Stanley isn't there anymore, maybe he leaves and it just doesn't work out. He did chop off that last year of his deal. If he's gone and the Ravens find a right tackle they really like in the offseason next year, they can move Rosengarten over there and it won't be all the, the hoopla of he has to relearn everything and it's this, it's this big deal. Yeah. He already has that experience. So for Rosengarten, I think it was a fine pick. Again, what it maybe wanted Kingsley by a hair there if I were the Ravens, but I understand the pick they made. This is the offensive line they want. And Rosengarten certainly fits the profile of what they needed. Plus, if they didn't go offensive line at 62, I don't, I don't know what a lot of people would have done in the fan base. I think it would have gotten a little ugly if they it didn't get offensive ugly, line for sure. as they're not going in the first round yet. <laughs> yeah, I don't think if you're a fan, you can really blame them for not going uh, offensive line in the first round. But yeah, if the second round comes around, you got those two guys, when Ray the Howard and Kingsley, and of course Rosengarten, and you don't take one of them, yeah, it's... It's trouble. Uh, but I, I think you're right. I think this was a Todd Munkin pick. I think uh, Rosengarten was the guy that they envisioned. And I also talked about earlier in the show, he could possibly be a guy that plays guard. I mean, they don't have uh, two guys, Kevin Zeitler and John Simpson anymore, uh, who were their, st their star worth at guard. They can possibly move him in. Again, he's a guy who's really good, agile, can move and pull and get into the second level easily. So that's also an option for them. So, yeah, you're right. Yeah. A guy who could play multiple positions and do a lot of things that Todd Munkin likes really really well uh let's move on to the third round i'm going to bring up my uh, device because i want to make sure i get it right adissa isaac penn state their second penn state rusher he's the guy in my opinion who's uh not like adafi all the way in the fact that he has the tools he he can swim he can he can do all of that stuff but he's just not as athletic in my opinion as Owe. but i think that he's more fixable than Owe was at this juncture in his career. I want to get your thoughts. You think? Are you happy with the decision to go edge rusher here? Is there maybe a chance that he could have gone receiver and you would have liked him more? And if so, who? Yeah, I think for me, the player, I, I love the player. Yeah. I, I, Isaac was someone that I had targeted in the pre-draft process, and it was more so earlier when we didn't really know what was going on with the Ravens' edge room, and you're thinking, all right, well, this guy's a consensus second rounder. If they want it, if he falls to 62, you can make that pick. Getting him at 93 is incredible value. Nuts. I think this was a BPA pick, and edge is still a need, at least it was still a need for them, even with the Calvin or re-signing. It just pushed it down the, the, the list a little bit of mm -hmm. those needs. Now, you mentioned wide receiver. I probably would have gone either wide out or maybe even another offensive lineman instead with this pick, but you can't fault the Ravens process for seeing a player that had fallen a little bit on their board. I mean, this is a BPA team. No one should be shocked about exactly. them wanting to go BPA. It's, it's exactly what they do, and it's exactly <coughs> how they've been able to be so consistent over the course of their franchise history, whether you want to call it succession plans or stacking depth at key positions. Plus, we talk about Baltimore's needs, Sam. I mean, offensive line, corner, edge wide receiver, those are premium positions. So getting mm -hmm. talented guys in on rookie contracts, and we're seeing the the market, the free agent market, just shelling out money for these guys, plus with the increase in cap, obviously, 
it's good to get that type of talent. Wide receiver wise, I think a lot of people were maybe targeting like a Troy Franklin at that pick or maybe Javon Baker. That that's another guy as well. So I would have been totally fine with that. Love the player. Positionally, I probably would have gone wide receiver or another offensive lineman, but we saw a couple of really good offensive linemen go right before Baltimore picked at 93. So maybe they were targeting a guy like Dominic Puny out of Kansas. He went, I think, to San Francisco right before. So I was I was kind of talking to myself into, hey, you know what? They might use two of the three first picks on offensive linemen, yeah. but you, you can't fault them for still getting edge is still a need for him, as I talked about, but yeah. a player that fell. BPA is king for the Ravens, and they went with that again here that he's Isaac. Yeah, and I, I think, again, other than the 49ers, really even more so than the Chiefs, the Ravens roster is really set. Uh, there are positions of need, of course, but they're little, just hints here and there. Their base at those positions are pretty much, uh, I think, are, are set for the most part. So I'm okay with the Isaac pick. As you mentioned, Troy Flank is a guy who I really liked. The fact that he fell out of the third round is something that will haunt me for the rest of my days. <laughs> I thought for sure that we get Troy Franklin and then having Denver pick him up and have him in pair with Bo Nix, I think that's going to be something we talk about in the future, uh, kind of along the lines of Jamar Chase and um, Burrow. So I just thought, man, a chance to get Franklin would have been great. But Again, based on what Isaac has done, I thought he was a second round player, at least fringe second round uh, for him to fall into this category for the Ravens is too much to pass up, especially in the area of need as edge. And you have Zay Flowers, you have Rashad Bateman already in your receiver room. You can take a chance and just go BPA. You don't have to reach, I would say, if you're the Ravens, even though I don't think Franklin's a reach at all. I think he's just a, a phenomenal player. Uh, but the Ravens go Isaac in third round. In the fourth round, they finally get their receiver, Tez Walker. A guy who I think maybe not to the level of Troy Franklin, in my opinion, but he's right there as far as what he can do on the field. What are your thoughts on Tez Walker? The Ravens finally go wide receiver. Is he a guy that you like, a guy that you looked at? And if not, uh, who would you think the Ravens should have taken in this place? Yeah, I, I like Tez Walker. And I think he was probably, after Franklin went, after Baker went, I think he was the next guy on my list that I was really excited about. I I had kind of felt like Baltimore was going to go wide receiver in the fourth because that was kind of like the four. I had mentioned the big four needs of wide receiver, yeah. offensive line, corner, and edge. That was like the last piece for them. And it felt like they wanted to get a wide receiver on a rookie deal. Now, Tez Walker gives you a lot in terms of his speed. He's a deep threat, somebody that can get over the top and put stress on defenses. To me, that's a role that, you know, the Ravens tried to send Rashad Bateman on those routes last year as a Flowers got in on that action. I think you can have a specific role for Tez Walker early, but it's not just all about his speed. He's a good contested catch player. He's someone that is a bigger bodied player as well. Some positions, you know, body size and all that doesn't matter as much if you have a lot of the same player wide receiver i do think you need a at least one bigger body player and i know people argue oh well, they have mark andrews and they have isaiah likely as their big body pass catchers that's awesome like don't get me wrong yeah but i think in the wide receiver room you still need one of those players so tez walker is somebody that you look at the room now it's you mentioned zay flowers rashad bateman you know, I think Tez Walker has an opportunity. And, and again, there's a lot of potential there with him where he still has a couple of things to work on. Obviously, the drops were a bit of an issue for him at UNC. That's an area he'll have to improve in. But once he gets settled in, Steve Smith Sr., there's a clip circulating on social media right now saying he could take somebody's job once he gets settled in and acclimated. Yeah. So there's a lot of untapped potential here with Tez Walker. And I think for me, based off everybody that was left, th this was the pick I would have made. Yeah, I think that you had to go here with the Ravens. And I think, um, again, even taking away the fact that I love Troy Franklin and they didn't go for that pick, he's really, really, he does so many things that you can't teach very well. The things that he doesn't do as well, I think the Ravens have the coaches have to polish it and make him a really dangerous receiver. And I just can't stop thinking about how DK Metcalf came in to the league. Similar uh, speed, maybe not as, you know, yoked up as he is, but a guy who didn't really run routes well, and then all of a sudden, as the seasons progress and as he gets acclimated to NFL action, he becomes one of the better route runners in the league. Uh, the Ravens went corner in round one. They go back in round four and pick up TJ Tampa, a guy who I am shocked, along with Cooper DeGene, that fell uh, the way that he did. Of course, he falls farther than DeGene, but uh, he does a lot of things. He really does things that... Pretty much Wiggins doesn't do well. He's a good at run stopping. He gets very physical at the line of scrimmage. What are your thoughts on the Iowa State corner? Are you happy with the pick, or do you see someone else possibly being there for the Ravens and they should have took him instead? 
Yeah, I don't know what's going on in Iowa with all these corners falling in this in this draft. The state of Iowa, I don't know. They might need to hype up their guys a little more. <laughs> but I think for me, this this was the pick. I mean, there's no. This is my favorite pick of the draft for the Ravens, just because of the value they got. Tampa was widely regarded, much like Adisa Isaac, as a second round pick. Mm-hmm. And when you get that value at one thirty at the back end of the fourth round, I mean, I think what Eric DaCosta and John Harbaugh kind of said was, "Look, we had our eyes on Tez Walker." The, the whole time here, but we didn't anticipate TJ Tampa because we just didn't expect him to be there. Like when there's a guy like that again, Warner wise, and I'm going to take that thing I said to you earlier, Sam, and, and amplify it. If you want to do this and replace who they had last year on the roster versus now, if you replace Ronald Darby and Rocky Yassin with Nate Wiggins and TJ Tampa, that, that's a it. that's a heck of an upgrade. I'll I'll tell you that much. But you're right, Tampa is somebody that is a physical player can, can get after it in the run game, and to me, still. He does work in coverage. I mean, he's someone that sticks with guys, but Wiggins and Tampa complement each other really well. I 100% agree with what you said there. And for me, you can never have enough corners. I mean, you talk about this franchise's history. Go back to, I mean, let's just go 2014. I'll never get over that year. They should have won the Super Bowl that year. Should have gotten Steve Smith Sr. his ring. Yep. But they were signing guys like Rashad Melvin off the street because there were just so many injuries in the secondary. We've seen it year after year where this team can get haunted with corner injuries. So now you have four really solid guys in Marlon Humphrey, Brandon Stevens, Nate Wiggins, TJ Tampa. Your slot position is set to corners become a strength for this team now with this. And for me, the first five picks of this draft, I think Eric DaCosta and company, the Ravens absolutely hit it out of the ballpark. Yeah, and it's, it's really hard to knock it. You mentioned it. These are the areas of need. And BPA-wise, they didn't reach for anybody. They just fell into their lap. Getting two premier corners in your first five picks is nuts. So definitely shout out to Eric DaCosta. You mentioned that was your favorite pick. This next pick is my favorite pick. Rasheen Ali out of Marshall. In my opinion, probably the best running back in the draft just because of the way he performed, even though he had that bicep injury in January. I think that took the spotlight out of him a little bit. But his ability to run on the outside, using zone uh, reads to really make plays, great compliment to Derrick Henry and possibly Key Mitchell when he gets back. Do you think there's another avenue the Ravens could have went here? I think this was more of a, okay, we really like this guy. Let's get him, fifth-round pick. Or uh, are you really happy with the selection with uh, Rasheen Ali? No, I I like it. I think to me, Ali is somebody, and you talk about the Keaton Mitchell aspect of the whole Ravens running back room right now. We don't really know when he's going to come back, but when he does come back, we know we know he has to have a role because he was that good for them last season. Now for Ali, he can slot into that Keaton Mitchell role for them early in the season while Keaton's still recovering, but it's a lot easier. And I think Ali has potential past this year, right? There's a lot that he can learn during his rookie season. Obviously when he got Derrick Henry, you just want to pick his brain as much as you can because he's one of the best running backs in this league still today. Right. To me, Ali is someone also can run (coughs) routes out of the backfield really effectively is someone that is a multidimensional player there were a couple running backs I was considering in this range. Maybe like a Kamani Vidal out of Troy, a couple others. But there was a run on running backs just before the Ravens picked in a couple of different rounds. And Eric DaCosta and John Harbaugh made it clear during the pre-draft press conference that they were looking at the running back room just to add somebody. So once Keaton comes back, I think you can slot Ali maybe into the game day and actives for the year and then reassess. But I think he can help this team early on. We know Derrick Henry is going to be the bell cow, but Justice Hill and Rasheen Ali slash Keaton Mitchell, they're going to have roles. So I, I thought it was a fine pick. I thought it was a solid one overall. Yeah, I, I really like that pick a lot. And when you mentioned it, they don't have Keaton Mitchell yet. So he's going to have to get some playing time along with Justice Hill. And I just really like that running back room in 2024 for the Ravens, especially when Keaton Mitchell gets back from injury. Now, next pick is a pick that, I'm just going to be honest, I didn't like it. I, didn't, I just think it's a head-scratcher to me. I don't understand why they did it. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Maybe you see something, or maybe the Ravens see something that I don't. Uh, Devin Leary, Kentucky quarterback. I, I just, I you got you still got offensive lineman issues. You don't grab another old lineman except for maybe that center uh, in, the, in the seventh round. But, man, I just... Talk me out the ledge here. I mean, it's a six round pick. It's not that big a deal. Uh, Devin Larry didn't really show me much. He didn't. He didn't look all that impressive to me. But are there characteristics or traits that you saw from Larry? Is there another position you would have thought would have been better, or or am I just talking on my butt here? Is, is this guy going to be a guy that can come in and possibly be a solid backup? I I, I didn't love this one either, Sam. Uh, okay. I'll be honest with you. Now I'll try to explain why I think 
they did this. Okay. To me, backup quarterback was a need that I was kind of pounding the table for for the Ravens. But once Joe Milton went off the board, I think it what picked 200 of the Patriots. That's mm-hmm. when it was. They got both Drake May and Joe Milton. So Crazy. They, they, they stole him from under the Ravens' <laughs> nose because that's the guy I would have gone with. But once Joe Milton was off the board, at that point, I just said, look, you can sign a backup quarterback an undrafted free agency if you really feel strongly about it. You don't have to spend the draft capital. There was nobody else below Joe Milton that I thought the Ravens should have used a pick on. So it's nothing against Devin Leary. I think there are a couple of things to like, but nothing necessarily popped for me at both the NC State tape and the Kentucky tape. So to me, it's a pick where you talk about a guy like Christian Mahogany and and the the whole thing with Mahogany was the ACL tear. He fell so far. I mean, he was, he was like the Voorhees, essentially. He fell super far, but I mean, the ACL happened in 2022 for him. So I would have probably tried to package two of those 200s picks Maybe you want to throw a pick from 2025 in there because we know with all the free agents they lost, they're getting four comp picks no matter what. There's right. there's no way they don't. No way. So you, you want to throw a couple of those 200 picks together, maybe a 2025 sixth or a seventh or whatnot, move up. Maybe it could have been for a Joe Milton, could have been for a Christian Mahogany. I just think once Milton went off the board, there wasn't another quarterback that I felt strongly enough the Ravens should have picked. I just really thought they should have done the undrafted free agency route there because, you know, Josh Johnson, not a long-term option. Malik Cunningham is, I don't think the Ravens are really sure about him right now. So, and even during the post-draft press conference, they were like, yeah, he's going to come in and compete for the number three job. So it's not really like he's going to be competing. It feels like Josh Johnson <laughs> is their guy and they're pretty set yeah. in that right now. So I just feel like they could have added a quarterback and undrafted free agency and, and used this pick in another way. Sounds like almost like they panicked and, and they picked him because they expected Somebody to fall that they didn't. I think it was one of those cases where, well, we're going to sit back and wait for somebody that we love to fall to us. And it didn't happen. It's one of those things where I think the Ravens would have been better off if they were a little more aggressive, especially in these later rounds where uh, trades are, are are easier to get. And get a guy like Mahogany, I think, would have been perfect uh, in this in this type of environment. But to get Larry, you know, they've, they've gotten rid of uh, late round picks before. Uh, so this wouldn't be surprised me if this is another situation where it happens, especially if they're considering him to be the third quarterback option. I think if he doesn't show something, maybe they see something in him that we don't. Who knows? But if there is one pick that I say lacked that oomph, that happiness, that happy-go-lucky nature of, okay, the Ravens made another player, brought in another guy, another rookie to come and uh, be that guy, then this is definitely that pick. I, I wasn't very uh, enthusiastic about this one at all. Um, after that, we have two other picks, um, Nick Samak and Sanusi Kane. Sanusi Kane, I really like. He reminds me a little bit of Bernard Powell for some reason. He's just very aggressive, not afraid to uh, jump out at the line of scrimmage. But I think these two guys are more so special teamers. Uh, Samak, I think, is going to, possibly have a chance to back up Tyler Lindenbaum and maybe even move in to guard eventually. I think that's their plan for him. Uh, what are your thoughts about these last two guys? Yeah, I think the Ravens did need a backup center, or at least just interior depth in general. I, I think, you know, before this, obviously, it was Passion McCary who was the backup center, but I like him more so free-flowing in a super sub sixth offensive lineman role yeah. where – he's not necessarily pigeonholed into one specific position. So if you can have Samick back up Tyra Linderbaum, I'm, I'm fine with it. I think a lot of people want to Bo Limmer from Arkansas. He won, I think, a couple picks before one of the Ravens' seventh rounders, or maybe it was a sixth rounder for Leary. I can't remember exactly, but they wanted him. It felt like the fan base, but I mean, it, it was fine. You know, I, I don't really, it was a pick that I was like, yeah, all right, <laughs> cool, we're, we're good. I think for uh, Sanusi Kane, though, he's somebody, uh, this was suggested to me today earlier, But with Patrick Queen gone, there's not necessarily as big of a need anymore to use two inside linebackers on the same field together Mm. all the time. We've seen the Ravens in the Chuck Clark days use the dime backer and and figure out how to get physical safeties or physical defensive backs towards the line of scrimmage. They still do it, obviously, with Kyle Hamilton and how they move him around the field. But if Trenton Simpson isn't necessarily panning out or if there are struggles or if, if something happens there and they feel like a guy like Sanusi Kane can bring that physicality and you want to use him in a dime linebacker role, I think that could be. The, the coverage skills are a little iffy right now yeah. for Kane, but I think his 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 trait right now is the physicality, the run support, and being able to be a presence down in the box. So yeah. to me, I thought it was a fine pick. The Ravens also got Bo Braid out of Maryland. So I think that those two together 
if they want to go, because the Ravens needed safeties. I mean, yeah, they obviously sure. have Hamilton and Marcus Williams, but they lost, you know, still and Daryl Worley. So the free agent was really only Hamilton and Williams. And that was it. Mm-hmm. So if you want to go young with your safety depth, with the Kane and Braid, I-, I think it's a quality option. Obviously, you just, you just have to make sure they can contribute because one of the reasons the Ravens defense was so good last year is because their depth stepped up when the injuries happened. So can well, Susie Kane or Bo Braid do that in a role if they needed to elevate a little bit in the NFL level? All right, Kevin, thank you so much for all your time. I appreciate it. Uh, getting your feedback on the draft. It's definitely, uh, your opinions definitely mirror mine for the most part. And I think the Ravens are looking uh, pretty good uh, for 2024. Uh, let the guys at home know where they can find your stuff. Yeah, you can find me over on Locked on Ravens five days a week, so Monday through Friday. You can subscribe on YouTube, follow along in audio form as well. We do a bunch of Ravens news analysis updates over there. You can also find me on the Ryan Ripken Show, talking Orioles, talking Ravens, the whole Baltimore sports scene over there, so you can subscribe over on YouTube for some fun conversation and some great sports conversation. Plus on Twitter at KaleShack34, you can find me over there as well. Appreciate it, Kev. I mean, I listen to you, Locked On Ravens, almost on a daily basis. And uh, I already told you, Ryan Ripken Show, that's probably my favorite Oreo show. You guys are the best. So uh, definitely plan to go over there and meet you guys in person and get your, some Ravens thoughts and get your Oreo thoughts as well as the season looks to be uh, pretty good so far. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I know I didn't, I didn't get to be down to the studio when you were there for the, for the championship. I know that, yeah. that was a rough after championship game yeah. episode. But you you powered through it, man. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person and uh, appreciate you having me on, man. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Again, that's Kevin Ostreicher with Lockdown Ravens and the Ryan Ripken Show. Uh, When we come back, we'll get final thoughts on the draft and then we'll look ahead to the uh, rest of mini camps, OTAs, and training camp as the NFL season vastly, very fast uh, comes to the uh, front view mirror. Next on the Ravens Talk Podcast. Welcome back to the Ravens Talk Podcast. Again, that was my boy, Kevin Ostreicher uh, with the Ryan Ripken Show and Lockdown Ravens Podcast. He agrees with me on a lot of points. I think the Ravens had a very good draft against the Devin Larry pick. Who knows? He could be the next Tom Brady, but it just I just don't get that feeling. It looks like a panic pick to me. Something, oh well, the guy that we wanted in the fall, what are we gonna do? Well, that guy from Kentucky's there. Let's uh we need backup quarterbacks. He's he's the best guy on the board. Let's let's get him in. You don't really need to do that, in my opinion. But hard to knock it when you make so many great picks. TJ Tampa comes in. Nate Wiggins, you got Rasheen Ali, a guy who I love, Isaac, Penn State rusher. I mean, the list goes on and on. Of course, Tez Walker, you know, the Ravens fans love their wide receivers. I think he's a guy who's going to contribute almost immediately, uh, being that deep route guy to come in and really force the defense to to play back a little bit, especially with Derrick Henry back there. It could be, could be a big season for this offense with Tez Walker being added in. And as uh, Kevin mentioned, not having to have your guy Rashad Bateman and, and Zay Flowers work those deep looks. They could be more intermediate receivers, and you know those two are are really good in that regard. Well, that's going to do it here for the Ravens Talk Podcast. What a offseason so far. The Ravens bring in Derrick Henry. Ravens have a star-studded draft. I mean, the consensus among peers across the league is that the Ravens had an A++ draft. Hard to disagree. Again, Devin Larry, we may only knock Troy Franklin, a guy who I think they could have brought in in the third round uh, instead of Tess Walker. But uh, Vegas can't be choosers. The Ravens to Pat didn't have to move much and got themselves a premier edge rusher from Penn State and Tess Walker, a guy who I think could be a dynamite receiver in a few years. We'll be back soon. We're going to get ready for the mini camps and OTAs. And then training camp comes and we're doing this all over again. The Ravens begin their quest. We're on a third AFC championship ring, a third Super Bowl trophy. They can get it done. It's possible. They had to get away from the Kansas City Chiefs, a team that has been uh, their Achilles heel as of late. But if there's a team that can get it done, it's definitely the Baltimore Ravens. We'll see you soon. Talk all about the Baltimore Ravens and what they need to do to get over the hump. See you next time.